love to introduce uh, Sophia Batchelor, uh, doctoral candidate. Sophia is a doctoral candidate and a fellow at the Center for Immersive Technologies in Leeds, UK. Primarily a neuroscientist, but always fascinated with immersive technologies. Her doctorate is focused on how our brains interpret virtual reality spaces and how we learn inside virtual reality. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I will turn things over uh, to you, uh, Sophia, for immersion and immersion and memory, how our brains understand virtual worlds. Awesome, thank you. Um, super excited to be following um, the previous talk as hopefully it fits in quite nicely. So, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, as Daniel introduced, uh, I'll be talking about immersion and memory um, and kind of using that as a premise to explain a little bit how our brains understand virtual spaces. But the key pieces that I want to kind of talk about is the interaction effects between immersion and presence and learning and why those values and then our experiences of presence and immersion is kind of ultimately all about perception. So I'll take us on a bit of a pathway and all the information they'll throw at you, no matter how disjointed kind of fits on this path. So the idea is that I'll explain a little bit about how we perceive reality um, and then use that to explain how we perceive in virtual reality, focusing in on visual perception. Then I'll explain how that perception supports the feelings of immersion and presence and how immersion and presence and the perception it relies upon supports learning. So, um, as Daniel said, um, I'm a neuroscience researcher who works at the um, Immersive Cognition Lab at Leeds alongside the Alan Turing Institute where my PhD rests inside um, and I previously did my degrees at Berkeley. So what I really do is try and understand the why of what we are by looking at the brain and technology. And how I do that is by building different technologies to understand um, and to interpret the brain and scan the brain that then help us improve the technologies that then help us image the brain better. And what that ultimately does in all my work is that we have a perception of the world and how we understand it. And then we interact with a perception. So whether that be the glass of water on my desk um, that I know is a certain weight and a certain distance away from me. And even if I close my eyes, I still know where that glass of water is because I have this cognitive model or this experience. Um, and that's kind of how these loops, these visual motor or sensory motor loops, allow us to form a model or a perception of the world. Um, but one of the key pieces are, who are you and what do you want? So I don't really know anyone um, out in the audience. And so if there are concepts that I'm talking about in my talk that are old hat that everyone knows about, um, I'll keep an eye on the chat and I would love to just breeze over them um, so that there are times that if I introduce something new, um, I can spend a little bit more time on it and expand on any of the points. Um, it's a little bit harder on Zoom, so I will be keeping an eye on the chat for that. Um, so as with the last talk, I've thrown around these words of immersion and presence um, that are thrown around a lot by virtual reality, by developers and researchers alike. Um, we talk about immersive technologies, we talk about the psychological sense of being there, which was um, the definition proposed by Mel Slater, um, first in 2007 and then again in 2009. Um, we also hear that virtual reality is a technology, I'm just going to check that it's not in the way, is a technology that provides something that's almost real, um, that is completely there, but what does that actually mean um, when something's computer generated, and that the goal of immersive technologies is to immerse you, but again, that's just kind of using the word reflexively within the definition. So within um, immersion, within gaming, within development, um, there are key, three key elements that have been around since the early 90s, and that's the idea of tactile immersion. So when I touch something, whether it be a desk in front of me, whether that be a controller, we have the idea um, that tactile immersion is what allows you to pick up a certain skill. And um, then we have strategic immersion, um, which apparently is more cerebral, but that's like the idea of actually having to develop a cognitive schema or a model in order to solve something and having that cognitive model and schema be specific to whatever task you are immersed in. Then there's the idea of narrative immersion, um, which you could get reading a book, you can get watching a movie because it's you're immersed in the storyline itself. Um, and then more recently, since the um, invention of spatial um, computing, XR, VR, AR, or Emma, there's an idea of spatial immer immersion being somewhere in a place where you are physically not. These are definitions are used primarily by the games industry, 
Um, however, within virtual reality itself, we tend to use immersion as a descriptor of the technology's capabilities itself. So here are some of the um, different pieces of the technology and the different limitations the technology can offer that allow us to feel immersed. Um, this comes from Michael Abrash from his time at Valve, and the Valve team still uses this. These are examples such as the PPD or the pixel density, so having a low pixel um, persistence, having adequate resolution so that we don't have the screen door effect, um, and things like tracking and uh, correct calibration. So that's all immersion. If immersion is about the technology, what is presence? Um, so this is a wonderful quote that I, I really enjoy from, again, a paper from Mel Slater. Um, and he's talking about how immersion is a wavelength. Um, then presence is how we actually perceive the color because presence is a human reaction, our reaction to immersion, to the technologies, capabilities that we've been presented. So presence is considered by its response. If a person experiences a high amount of presence, then they will respond to the stimuli as if it is real, um, as if they would in the real world. A virtual response mirroring the same response that you would have in the real world. Meaning that presence is about the interaction. It's about the information that your senses are giving you, whether those be generated by a computer or whether those be in the real world, and responding to them the same way. Which brings us to this really um, important piece that I kind of that I hope everyone takes away from this talk today is about how what we experience is a factor of what we remember, our memories, um, our remembered experience of something, and our interaction. So I know where my cup of water is on my desk without looking away from my computer. I know approximately how much water is left in it, and I know that if I reach out to grab it, I will hold something in my hand because I expect something to not suddenly have disappeared off in space. So what my experience is of either holding up the glass is from my memory matched with my real cute interaction with the world. So when we experience presence, we experience this presence when our interactions in picking up the glass matches the expect expectation or the memory model that we have. Which brings us to a little bit of understanding of how the world exists. If I look at that cup of water, if I look at my computer now, I look at my desk, I can see that because there are photons that bounce off objects at depth. There are approximately 26 million neurons in the retina, being there are five different types of those. Those 26 million neurons then synapse onto about 1 million, um, which become our optic track. Um, if you're kind of familiar with this, you may have seen images like this before, kind of um, information going in through the eye, being centered and focused on the fovea. Um, and then if you're more familiar with a bit of deeper visual perception, you'll understand about the visual fields um, and how those cross over and link at the optic chiasm before getting processed in our primary visual cortex right at the back of our brains here. Um, and this is kind of a lot of visual perception. It's kind of thinks more about the actual photons um, and the sensory stimuli that we respond to in our brains, as opposed to our understanding and the tie-in with our expectations and our memory models. And this memory model is more how we actually interact of the world. We do have um, a full model of the world of physics. If I kick a ball, I know approximately what force I'll have to do and about how far it will go. It's one of the reasons why humans are very exceptional. It's something called interceptive timing is that when you see a ball um, coming towards you, you can reach out and approximately move your hand to where you think that is going to be. In the same way that if you're playing Snap or Uno with your friends, um, you know where to put a card down, or if you are playing Snap, how to get your hand down a little bit faster than your friends. But in virtual reality, this is a little bit different because instead of photons bouncing off objects in space, um, we have a screen a few centimetres away from our face and the stimuli is all presented using RGB pixels um, and a set number of pixels on the display and different light um, being projected within the headset itself within the h &D, which differs greatly headset to headset and therefore there's no actual objects bouncing off space and everything is simulated, including depth. This, um, as I was mentioned earlier, we may be familiar um, if we work within virtual reality with something called the convergence accommodation error. And that's because normally if I look at something far away from me, 
um, the different wavelengths that I will be looking at. I can perceive the depth. However, within virtual reality, I'm not actually perceiving something. I'm perceiving something that is close when actually it is very, very far away in reality and vice versa. So this arises what we call the convergence accommodation error. So there is this great difference in a visual perception that we have when a screen is a few centimeters or millimeters away from our eyes versus objects in the real world. But we still assume that the model of the world that we have constructed in the real world is the same as the model that we are expected to adhere to in virtual reality. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see as a researcher when um, I experience different virtual reality games and one of the pieces that I consult on. Because visual perception isn't just in the tiny first piece um, of your brain. Uh, if you've never seen this before, this is an fMRI or a functional MRI um, image based on someone seeing a moving bar around a screen. Um, and this is from a colleague, Jeffrey Anderson. Um, and what this really, what I use this image to show is that while an image moves, it is perceived differently in different parts of the brain, although this is still the visual, uh, the visual cortex or the visual areas of the brain, there is different levels of activation within your brain. And furthermore, that it's not just the visual cortex, that you, your brain entirely all works together to create a visual reconstruction of the world. So there's the two examples, the lateral geniculic nucleus or the Algean, which is a midbrain um, area quite close to um, the hippocampus and the posterior temporal cortex, which is the side here which is still, and these areas are responding to visual stimuli that were presented. And the reason I've kind of brought this in here and now is because the idea that vision is not just processed in the eyes, it's not just what we respond to, it's also not just processed in the primary visual field, but it is a whole brain integration to create an understanding of the world where just one sense is inputting information in. So, that was how we did it in the real world. And if something is happening differently in virtual reality, then there will be a difference in our perception and a different in a, in a reconstructive model of our worlds. Now, uh, dialing in on depth perception specifically, there are 12 cues that we use to perceive something at depth that get integrated and processed to create a little world models, that being focus, <laughs> perspective, occlusion, um, knowing that something is behind something else, I know that it still exists even if I can't see it. Lighting, shading, saturation, and contrast. Color is one of the most important parts of how we understand the world. If you look at this image here, what you you may see are green balls, red balls, and blue balls, um, but actually they're all just brown. Uh, if you uh, do any computer graphics or computer vision, you also may be familiar with this illusion. Um, we see color uh, square A being a little bit darker than square B, um, but due to how we use, how our brains reconstruct our world models based on shading, unfortunately, I have to say that they are actually the same color square, square A and B, no matter how many times you look at this, they are the same color. As I mentioned, we also use vergence um, and perceiving things to allow us to perceive things at depth. We use motion cues and we call stereo and we also do stereopsis. And these are generally the cues that we use to understand something at depth. And there are 12 of them there. So you can screenshot the slide. I can also share it separately if it's useful to you. So um, there's also a fantastic paper that, again, I can link to and send out after the talk if you'd like this to read a little bit more about these different cues and how when they're missing in virtual reality, um, we may see something a little bit different. So we have our model of the world. <laughs> What um, all of this is to say is that when our expectation of the world diverges from what the information is that we're actually getting, there's something called a conflict. And these conflicts can be resolved by adapting a schema or adapting our understanding of the world um, by flagging that event as an important exception or by completely ignoring it. So your brain is like, no, sorry, that thing doesn't exist. In the same way that you saw those checkerboards, your brain's like, no, those are definitely different squares I don't care how many times you can show me a solution, they are the same thing and your brain will just ignore it. And the more discrepancies that we have in the world, the more wonky and more odd our experience will be, 
because our interactions are not matching up with our memory models. And this difference, this conflict, this divergence is a really important piece because if we want to create a strong memory, if we want to teach someone something, we can do this by flagging this thing, this different thing as an important exception. So to allow us to remember something better. Um, one of the experiments that we do in the lab um, that can show this is what we call visual motor adaptation. Um, so you may be familiar with it if you ever play carnival games um, that are often rigged, is that traditionally if you're trying to aim something straight but the game is rigged, so it will wait over to one side, um, it creates a conflict. And so you'll have to adjust the amount of rigging or the amount of error in the game. So what we have is that um, there is something on the screen or in virtual, in virtual reality that represents where your hand is, but that's not actually where your hand is. So um, between two degrees and 10 degrees um, every single time, it will say that your hand is going straight, when in reality, it will be moving more and more to the right or to the left. Um, what we see then is that well, people will acquire that. They will know that they have to drag their hand off at an angle in order to get the thing straight. And what we will also see is that there is a stronger washout effect in virtual reality than in reality. Is that if you were playing a little skeet shooting game um, in the real world, you would learn the amount of... Um, you would learn the angle, the amount of adjustment, the amount of adaptation you have to make in order to shoot straight. Um, however, you learn that adaptation, you learn how much error you have to account for far faster in virtual reality with the exact same game or the exact same task. And what this kind of this piece that I'm really trying to get across with this game, with this task especially, is that virtual reality sessions have resulted in better learnings for different tasks. And what I'm trying to say there is that you can learn things better in virtual reality than in reality. Um, another one of the tasks um, that has shown time and time again that people can learn better in virtual reality um, is a maze game where you have to solve the maze by avoiding the drop holes. Um, here are some <laughs> results. And so um, the four groups, there was a group that did the task completely um, in the natural world, showing using one of the mazes similar to the one I showed you on the previous slide. There was a group that did the task learning it in the real world, but testing in virtual reality. And there was a group that swapped that by learning the group the task in virtual reality but testing in the natural world and then our final group completed everything in the in virtual reality and what we found was that the groups that that learnt the task in virtual reality outperformed the groups that or the individuals that learnt the task in reality um, the, uh, the lines are quite close together but there was a statistical significance between groups four and groups one. Group four is the darkest line. As you can see, it is the steepest slope um, and also the lowest point, um, meaning that they learnt the task the best and also faster. Um, then the lightest color, which was the group that did it in the natural world. Um, we also saw a, unidirect a unidirectional or unilateral transfer, which is the difference between groups one and three and groups two and four. What that means was that groups who learnt the task in virtual reality could transfer their learnings to the real world, whereas the, the people who would learn the task in the natural world could not transfer the skill as effectively in virtual reality. Um, and kind of going back to this concept of how our experience, what we actually experience, our cognition, our understanding, this little model that we have, um, as a factor of our memory and our interaction is that when there is a conflict that causes a break in the experience, we have this break of immersion and this break in presence. And in order to get better presence, we need to match the cues that we are getting, specifically that previous experiment, it was the visual cues and the proprioceptive cues as well as the auditory cues. And so another example of this is that we did an experiment um, where we had haptic gloves that had um, thermistors in them as well as Peltier devices. So they got very, very hot or very, very cold. Um, we sent people up to explore a snowy landscape 
or um, into the woods to find a fire pit. The closer you got to the fire, the hotter the gloves got. You could pick up snow and there'll be vibrotactile responses, as well as the gloves would um, get very, very cold. And we did this to try and examine how adding in additional cues, whether those be both haptic cues and also thermal cues, um, would help someone feel more present and would help this, you know, through immersion um, and whether or not they would be able to learn better or do the task better in virtual reality. Another key piece from this experiment was around the depth cues that, I, that we were using. We had near field, so close to the individual, mid field, far field. We had orientation lines. Um, and we also had the um, perspective going off into the distance with motion parallax on the clouds. So what I'm kind of getting at here is that if our experience um, is about our memory, what we understand about the world, matching up with our current interactions, then presence must, and then presence is about our immersion matching with our experience because every experience we have changes your brain. If I move my arm up and down, um, the area of my motor cortex that is in charge of the um, flexion and extension of my bicep will grow larger. You see this in master pianists, how their fine digits and the areas that represent their fine digits are significantly larger and more myelinated um, than novel, uh, than novice pianists. So when we're building virtual reality, what we really want to be thinking about is what are we actually trying to teach our brains? What are, information are we trying to give them? And ultimately, what is the person trying to come out with? Are we trying to teach someone math? Are we trying to teach them to how to learn how to drive? Are we trying to teach them how to catch a ball or throw a ball? Or how to stop a nuclear meltdown? <laughs> now, those, for example, seem a little out there, but they are actually four things that have been shown to be more effective at learning in virtual reality. And what this all allows us to build is something called the VR spectrum. Um, the idea is that we have environmental fidelity or photorealism um, compared against a sensory input and how the sensory input is either matching the cues that we expect or um, diverging from them and allows us to kind of understand the technologies, the relationship between them and which ones are better to teach people certain tasks than others. And this is because our immersion and presence, the more immersive a technology is not just going to be the more present that you are, but immersion and presence depends specifically on matching an expected cue and the perceived cue, what you expect from mental model of the world and the perception, the information that you're getting from the interaction itself. And those again, to recap, the cues, the depth specifically that we rely on, a focus, perspective, occlusion, lighting, everything we know about color, vergence, motion cues, and stereopsis or binocular vision. Um, so how does immersion and presence and allowing these cues to um, match kind of affect learning? Is that with a motor um, interaction, we use these motor primitives, so we use building blocks um, to create something. So whether that be a reach, a reach is, um, a reach and a pickup of my water glass is formed of many, many building blocks of motion. Um, and all of those, every motion, every information, every piece of cue that we have um, is going to be a little bit noisy. I know approximately how heavy my water glass is. I know approximately how to pick it up. I know approximately um, how far away from me it is. And I know that through my senses, not necessarily numerically. But all of that is noise that we have. And so the more noisy a stimuli or the more disparity there is between the actual cues, the less accurately we're going to be able to perform a motion. The more the cues match, the more we actually use um, a strong, fast path within our brains to learn it and the stronger we are going to learn that experience. And those two concepts are called the idea of modified weak fusion. Um, if you want to look up that theory. And again, here are some more references that you will be able to read a lot more about the premise that um, we rest our theories on. So again, the key part that I wanted you to remember was that what we experience is a factor of our memory and our interaction. And so immersion and presence really depends on matching expected cue and the perceived cues, the cues that we're getting. Um, because 
the ways that we learn is that we can adapt a schema. Um, or we can flag this as an important exception, a brand new learning event that has different rules, different world, different models, because the more discrepancies, the more wonky our experience, the more likely it is for our brains to throw it out and ignore it completely. So the important bits so far from the research that we've done and the research that I, I brushed over a little bit today um, was around depth cues, having a near, a mid and a far field depth cue. Again, I've said a lot, but the continuity of cues, um, whether that can follow a law model, the same way that we have Newtonian physics and relativity, um, as long as there is a full complete model, um, it doesn't matter as long as everything that we have in virtual reality follows a model that is congruent. Um, the absence of the additional or true orientation points, is that something which uh, came up in chat earlier with caves versus um, HMDs? And in a cave, you have verdicial um, orientation points due to the lines of the wall. Um, now, when you take those away or put someone in a dome, they are far more likely to have this experience of presence and the cues or the false cues you're given in the virtual reality are going to be far more, uh, far more receptive. Um, and therefore, in virtual reality, you want to place back in horizontal and vertical lines because ultimately, here we are, resolving cue conflict is what supports learning, not necessarily photorealism, because it's not about photorealism, it's about sensory motor coherence. All right, <laughs> final slide, I promise. <laughs> so the part that we took again at the beginning was about how we perceive reality and the different cues that we use um, to construct this kind of model of the world and how our brain understands it, because then we can perceive things in virtual reality and construct models of those. Um, because if your brain believes that the cues that you're getting are the same, then you're going to have a learning event. Thank you. Amazing. Sophia Bachelor, thank you so much. That's a really, uh, really exciting presentation as well. Um, a couple of the questions here. Uh, Nemo, uh, would this mean that virtual reality is more cognitively taxing than seeing the same scene in real life? Um. Potentially, it, it, the, if your cues are going to be most like completely different. So, uh, for uh, for example, if I am asking someone to kick a ball in virtual reality and it doesn't really move, it will create a, a greater cognitive load. But the more your cues match up with one another, the less cognitively taxing it will be. Great. Right. And another question from Nemo, are you aware of any research comparing learning in VR to rehearsive learning with musicians or dancers, where they only visualize or visualize while making micro scale movements? So um, my, the micro movements, yes, that is actually how a lot of the um, research is going, not so much with musicians. Uh, typically, researchers try to avoid any outliers such as very very skilled musicians because it gives you a weird sample and statistics and validity uh, which is again I'm very critical of the academic community for that um dances again is very difficult because it is a whole body movement um how we move in three dimensions so a three-dimensional reach is very different from a planar reach um, it's actually processed through a different pathway in the brain. And sadly, at this point, the research has been focused on planar reaches. It's been focused on tapping. It's been focusing on presses. Um, and I've seen a few things with like multi-hand movements. Um, but at this point, not, we're not seeing a lot of three-dimensional stuff in the literature, which is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a great, great question uh, around um, whether the, the, the presentation is being recorded. And yes, these will be uh, available on emcop.ca. We'll put the uh, URL for that on the last slide that we present. But, uh, but agreed, these are, these are extraordinary presentations that we're getting to see. Um, from Locke Brown, VR is often talked about as an empathy machine. Does your work intersect with this level of interpretation and its implications? My work specifically doesn't because I am highly critical, and this is my own personal bias as a researcher, is that I'm very critical of VR as an empathy machine, um, because a lot of response to that, you know, milk quote coming out was, oh, let's just do a 360 video capture of a refugee camp and put, you know, affluent people in this and boom, empathy. And that's not quite how it actually works. Um, and so there is a difference between, because our presence is based around interaction, or that's at least what we're seeing, <laughs> Um, 
you can't just slap someone in front of a screen and say that you're feeling something. Um, and a lot of the studies that are done around emotion and virtual reality um, have small sample sizes, not as great of, um, of a kind of basis as that they often talk about two different levels of analyses. And so what um, I, I've tried in my work to kind of focus a lot more on how the brain is responding to it um, and using that as a basis for for greater works to come along is that we're really just scratching the surface in our understanding of virtual reality. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, would like love for you to go explore that because <laughs> there's, there's, I'm, I'm just down here at the base level of the building blocks. Well, wonderful, thank you. Um, I have a question, I'm curious, uh, given the differences in, uh, in perception, what's going on in the brain when we're looking at a virtual image versus when we're looking uh, at an actual object, I know there's a lot of talk around the differences uh, around the, the potential implications of young people uh, whose brains are still under more rapid development uh, using virtual reality extensively. And I'm wondering if, if your work kind of touches, touches on that or what your, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, um, so I, one of, the, one of the big projects that I'm on is called Born in Bradford. Um, we are um, similar to the ACES study that Kaiser Permanente did in California is that you're working with children who have adverse um, experiences who come across um, great amounts of adversity um, and uh, are really underserved. And so one of the ways in which we're trying to understand how their brains are developing currently and then develop a virtual reality invention to kind of even the playing field um, using, again, a lot of these, these kind of like neural, um, neural basics. Um, because something I kind of breeze over that I normally spend a little bit more time on is that every experience we have changes the brain. I kind of, I mentioned a pianist, um, is that an expert pianist has a different brain structure than a novice pianist, but in the same way that I have a different brain structure to you, only about one third of our neural architecture is shared between individuals. Um, the joke for anyone who's in neuroimaging is that you can put one of your friends or family in an MRI and go like, oh my God, that's so weird, I've never seen that before, and freak them out. Um, when in reality, you can do that for everyone because our brains are entirely shaped um, by our experience. They're very, very different and with a lot of the images, what we do look at and what we report are the, the, the similarities. It's why we try and find people from very similar backgrounds and very similar groups when you do a study in order to find something significant that's different. And so it's something that in my research, and especially the work I do with Born and Bradford, is that we really try and focus more on what can we do to give them a better chance? What can we do to even the playing field? Is that give them a not an educational advantage, but really just bring things up so that they will have the same opportunity as anyone who had not necessarily been through the same experiences they had um, in their formative years. And in the same way as that I try to focus kind of positively, there is the, the flip side of that and that a lot of the work I did um, when I was at Berkeley was seeing that we were reaching um, sub-threshold levels of um, PTSD. Um, so that there's cortisol, galvanic skin response, um, and so you're seeing those accumulate over time. Um, that there are experiences of virtual reality because your brain is confusing reality with not reality. Um, you are creating these, um, these same uh, fear and avoidance uh, anxiety pathways. So don't right. stab your friends in VR. <laughs> <laughs> important, yeah, really important, especially given where a lot of the design in uh, on, on games is going. Um, mm -hmm. From Hannah, have you done any research on virtual reality and context-dependent memory? Do visual VR settings translate well to real-world settings in learning? So, con so I don't look at um, context transfer as much. I more I look at transferable of learning. So, transfer of learning is being able to learn a task in one context and transfer it out of it, as well as generalize it across tasks. Um, but there is a significant body of work looking at context specific um chris his last name starts with a b is a, a lab um at cornell um and and in new york um so he's fantastic person to look up um he does a lot of stuff online as well if you want to send him an email um skip rizzo so alfred um alfred rizzo um at the university of south Cal southern california also does a lot of work in that um, 
I think also Jen Bronner, um, who's here over in the UK with me. Um, I think she's at Brunel. She's still at Brunel. So those are some names. If you want to Google, you might be able to find some more work there. And I thought I see Nemo's question in the chat. Uh, yes, 3D reach is a very, very worthy, worthy, awesome area of research. If you're um, looking for things to investigate, it's difficult, but it is awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophie Bachelor, for the time and for the presentation. Really, really interesting stuff.